Can I tell you a secret? I like questions. And my job at Google is to understand how people ask questions, why they ask questions, and how they get to the answer. So what do people do? So I was really excited when my kids turned seven and eight because I know at that age they ask questions. And what kind of questions do they ask? They ask why questions. Why this? Why that? Why the other thing? And you know how questions like that go. They either turn into theology or cosmology. <laughs> and then you have to figure out, well, now how do I answer questions like this? And so I was really excited when my kids were that age because I knew they'd be seeing things like this, the northern lights. And they'd be asking, what's going on? Why is this like that? Now, these things start with a sense of awe and wonder. And they lead to questions. They lead us to be curious about the world. And that's where I come in. How do we answer questions? How do we answer questions now? And so, the key idea for my talk today is that we can now ask impossible questions using technology. The nature of asking questions is intimately tied in with the way we represent knowledge in the world. So, for example, here's a picture. Where is this? Well, what you can do now with our search engine is ask by image. Take that image, drop it into the search engine, and it will not only tell you what that is, but exactly its street address. That's pretty phenomenal. So what is interesting to me is how simple questions like, what kind of caterpillar is this? have transformed from impossible questions to questions that you can answer almost instantaneously. The technology of asking questions is very different. This caterpillar is racing across the park bench to me, and it's attacking me. I whip out my cell phone, I take the picture, and then I drop it into my search engine, and I discover in about two seconds that it is, in fact, a spotted woolly tussock moth caterpillar it's non-toxic, don't worry about it, you can pick it up. Previously, how would I have answered that question? I don't know, actually. Okay? So what's interesting is how technology is woven into the way we think about the questions we can ask. We all read text on electronic devices. And one of the key elements of electronic device reading skill is find text in document. So a fundamental online reading skill is the ability to do Command F or Control F or Edit Find. That is, to look throughout the long text for a particular piece of text that you're searching for. Now, if you're on this kind of keyboard, it's Command F. If you're on that kind of keyboard, it's Control F. If you can't remember what kind of keyboard you're on, it's Edit Find. Okay? And once you do that, you can look at a long text document like this. This is the results from a race on an 8K here in Palo Alto. Now, question for you. If I ask you, how long did Beth Assange take to run this race? How long do you think it would take you to find out? I asked 85 people this question. This is a remarkable graph. If you see on the left-hand side, a lot of people got it in under 20 seconds. Look at the right-hand side. What are those people doing? Answer, they're going line by line by line visually looking for Beth Assange's name. But suppose she registered as Elizabeth Assange, or Bess, right? How would you find it? So what I find interesting about this graph is that not only do a lot of people not know this fundamental skill of asking questions of text, but they don't know what to do next. So the question really is becoming, for these people, how do we get them to a state of knowledge? Notice the thing on the right-hand side? If you take more than 120 seconds, what's happening is that your error rate goes way up because these people are finding false positives, false matches, and they answer incorrectly. Wait a second. They answer a simple question like that incorrectly. That seems incredible to me. So I thought uh, what I would do is find out how many people actually know this skill. How many people in this audience, how many people watching a video know this? I did a big survey. 90% of U.S. internet-using people do not know how to find text in a document. What's worse, in some ways, is that 50% of the teachers in the U.S. don't know this. This should scare you. 
we did a big survey of a bunch of Firefox users, same result, 90% of the, the internet using population don't know this fundamental skill. What that does is it changes the kinds of questions they can ask. If you know the control F trick, the skill of looking for text online, it changes the way you think. Here, for example, I could ask you the question, how many times does the word behold appear in a document, say the King James Version of the Bible? Now, if you know that Chrome actually has this little interesting characteristic, when you type Control F in Chrome, it actually not only finds the text, but actually gives you the number of hits in the document. Here's an unexpurgated video of me answering this question. It takes about 35 seconds for me to go from not knowing the answer to being able to find the answer very, very quickly. So here is, without editing, me searching for the full text of the King James Bible, going to Project Gutenberg, downloading the entire text, and once it's displayed in my browser, I can type Control F and search for the word Behold. You can see it showing up on the right-hand side in the scroll bar. Each little yellow line is one instance of that word. Now that we found it, we can actually read the number right off the top. And there you go, the answer is 1,349. I went from zero knowledge to understanding an interesting and impossible asked question almost instantaneously. So you see what happens is that not only do we have these pieces of technology that change the way you think, but we embed these in a culture where we have different kinds of documents, different kinds of genres of media that are out there. So here's a whole bunch. You know about home pages, you know about massive online games, you know about draggable maps. But here's one I want to point out to you. Do you know about spoof sites like that one? Here's an example. This is the famous Northwest Tree Octopus, right? Warning to you students, this is not a real animal. But you have to know more generally that there are spoof sites, that these things actually exist, not the octopus, but the spoof site. Beware. There are dragons there. Now, these people put up this site for a good reason. They're trying to teach you credibility. But what's interesting is that understanding things like credibility is understanding that there are genres of things like spoof sites or other features of text that you need to know about. Like, do you need to know the semantics of an emoticon? Yes, you do. Why is that? Because it's the kind of thing that happens all the time in our text. I'll give you an example. I discovered on a QA site the other day this question. Is it true that Rosa Parks would have moved to the back of the bus, but she was listening to her iPod? <laughs> yes or no? The answerer, the first answer to this question says, yes, it's true. And the asker says, that's great. I'll put that in my report. You have the nicest avatar. <laughs> Take it from me, the beauty of an avatar is no basis for assessing credibility of a result. What went wrong? What went wrong is that she didn't understand this icon, the universal symbol of sarcasm, the colon P, right? She's making it up. You need to understand the tools, the genre, the media, the content. And it allows you to do things like this. This is a crazy hard problem. Here the question is, here's a picture that I took somewhere in the world. Question. What's the phone number of the office where I'm standing when I took that photo? Does that sound hard? Well, it turns out you can actually work with what you have. In this case, the top of that tower has the logo of this company, and it says TP. Now, if you do a search for that, TP office building, it's not toilet paper. It turns out to be actually Telecommunica Polska. It's downtown Warsaw. Once you know that, you can go check out their website. In fact, it's exactly what you think for when you search for TP. You get the idea. I'm stringing together these little steps that allow me to ask questions by putting together operations to go from impossible question to answer. Once I have this, I can go to Street View, verify that's in fact the right building. You see where this is going? I can now take that image, go to that street address, and match it up with the 3D view in Google Earth. Now what do I do? I do that database operation that your professors never have told you about, which is to turn around. And once you have that, once you know that you can start to compose these images and these steps all together, 
you can answer amazing questions. So here, for example, is just the image that's actually in the background there. You flip it around, you realize it's the Google office in that building. You now know the street address is, and there is the phone number. In about two minutes, I went from not knowing to knowing the phone number of where the office is that the photo photograph was taken. You see where I'm going with this? This kind of stuff changes the way we think about question asking. The future of asking questions is knowing what's possible. Here's another example. We're in Palo Alto. It hasn't been raining much recently, but sometimes it does rain. And when it does rain, you might wonder, is it different here than in Seattle? And how would you find out? Well, here's one way to find out. Now, with search, you can look for data sets. You no longer have to trust someone else's opinion about whether rain here is qualitatively different than in Seattle. You can check. So I've downloaded two examples of data sets the same day, same period, from Seattle and from Palo Alto. I then fit a nice curve to that. I then remove the data, and you can see, yes, when it rains in Palo Alto, you know this, it pulses. It rains a little bit, it stops. It rains a little bit, it stops. When you're in Seattle, it starts raining, you're in for eight hours. It's very, very different. And now we can start to think about, well, why that is true. But the main point of this discussion is it changes the way we think. I'll give you another example. I was on Maui. I was on this beach down there in the lower left, in the, in the west, Wailea Beach. What time does the sun rise? That would be an interesting, easy question, except when you look at the mountain from just from the west of it, you look east, there is Haleakala, this giant volcano, just to the east. We have to account for that. And now you remember your basic trig. We have to compute the angle theta, so, oh, don't groan so much. <laughs> we have to compute the angle theta so we know how much time it takes for the sun to rise from out of the ocean up over the top of Haleakala. How would we do this? This is my point. With search engines and understanding the technology available on the internet, you now can think about these problems differently. So what I would do is actually go to Google Earth, draw a line, and you have to know that in Google Earth you can say, show me the elevation profile. Ah, right? Now, once I do that, I read off the rise and the run, the height and the distance. I now can plug those numbers into my basic trig functions. You could then, of course, go to Google and search for something like, what's the definition of tangent? Opposite over adjacent. I can plug those numbers in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Each of these is another step. The last step, you convert from radians to degrees and discover the sun will rise. About then, you go out and take the picture. In fact, you're correct. Okay? Now, remember all you people who groaned? I've got a better solution for you. I can ask for right triangle angle calculator because one of the genres of things you might not know about is there are a ton of calculators out there, including for teachers, don't listen to this. Don't listen to me, right? Including right triangle calculation functions. You can pour those numbers in to a tool like this and get the answer out instantly. So we've gone from an impossible question to something that basically only takes a couple seconds to do. It expands the notion of the way you think about the world. Another thing we're seeing is the change in which we can frame questions. So this place is just across the street from a high school. What I can do, of course, is whip out my phone and using an image taken through Google Goggles, query reality. I can actually ask, what is that? And it will not only tell me what it is, but give me the web page in an instant. We can now query reality. It's important to also understand that not only do we have tools to query and tools that we can string together in interesting ways, but we also have to understand the genre and content and media that's out there. For example, here I have side by side the Italian Wikipedia article and the English Wikipedia article about Leonardo da Vinci. Okay? I've handily translated it for you into English using a translation service. Now watch this. Notice any difference? 8,000 words in English, 23,000 words in Italian. The Italians really care about da Vinci. 
they pour a lot of their soul into that Wikipedia article. And what's interesting to note is the section in Italian on the biography of da Vinci is twice the length of the entire English article. I have just opened for you an entirely different culture by composing this tool, the translation tool, with your ability to search. I want to leave you with this short demonstration of where the future of technology is taking us in the ability to ask questions. One of the things that's marvelous is we what can are the speak northern lights? and ask, what are the northern lights? According to Library of Congress, polar lights are a natural phenomenon found in both the northern and southern hemispheres mm -hmm. that can be truly awe-inspiring. Northern lights are also called by their scientific name, Aurora Borealis, and southern lights are called Aurora Australis. And I can ask deep questions. What is the cause of the Aurora Borealis? And get good answers. According to science, the auroras, both surrounding the North Magnetic Pole and South Magnetic Pole occur when highly charged electrons from the solar wind interact with elements in the Earth's atmosphere. Show me pictures of how the solar wind creates the aurora. Pictures of how the solar wind create the aurora. Here you go. You can see the future, can't you? What is the solar wind made of? According to qrg.northwestern.edu, the solar wind is a stream of energized, charged particles, primarily electrons and protons, blowing outward from the sun through the solar system at speeds as high as 900 kilometers per second and at a temperature of 1 million degrees. It is made of plasma. We have moved from an age where asking questions was hard because of the technology that we used to have. We are now in a time we can ask these interesting deep questions in a conversational style and start to see where we can go with this. The future of asking questions is A, knowing what content is out there, B, knowing the tools that are available to you and knowing how to combine these to ask the best right questions. Once you know that, you need to understand what those tools can do for you because what I love is being able to ask questions that have deep answers and allowing us to generate answers that are really interesting and allow us to understand our world better. Like my kids asking these why questions, what we want is to go from a place of awe and wonder to a place of deep understanding. And that comes from a deep underlying sense of curiosity. Stay curious, my friends. Thank you.